You're listening to The Starting Zone. This is The Starting Zone's live call-in show, where we hear questions from you, our patrons. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. Today is November 27th, 2021, and my name is Spencer Downey. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to our podcast. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Lucas. And Jason, how are you doing this holiday Hello, weekend for yourself down there? Hello. I'm still conscious. Uh, <laughs> the turkey 8, coma has not taken over? <laughs> PM. Yeah, I don't know. It's been it's been a, a hectic but fun uh, couple of days. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I might be a little out of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of work and stress goes into a big holiday. You know, we were hosting the holiday dinner and everything. And, you know, uh, my, my wife was really working hard, my brother-in-law also. And then, um, I spent most of today cleaning up, you know, trying to, trying to get the house back into a usable state. So, uh, I had to take a little nap, but so I'm feeling a bit refreshed. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, Thanksgiving is always wow time. Right, because that's when Thanksgiving in the U.S. is is right around when WoW originally came out, and in many many years there have been you know patches or expansions released right around this time, and you know Thanksgiving is one of the biggest holidays in the U.S. It's like one of the only times that I tend to like get a couple consecutive days off uh, during the work year, other than like you know an actual vacation that I'm scheduling. So. Many a time it's been like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. That means I'm going to like play 96 hours of WoW in addition to whatever else is going on. Um, yeah. This year, kind of not so much, but, you know, it, it is, it, it's definitely like, it always feels like WoW time, uh, you know, and obviously in, in a modern context, we got the, se- the 17th anniversary going on in the game and all that. So, you know, it's, it's reflected in the game as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's not just the anniversary in game. We have all the the events happening in game around Thanksgiving, including and I, I don't know if you've gone and done this yet, but you got to eat at all the different places on the table and get the mm-hmm. the spirit of sharing buff to get your uh, your turkey, yeah, uh, the turkey soul critter shape, shape, your critter yeah. shape. Yeah, so be sure you're getting that done for sure. It, it takes some time because it's a <laughs> it's a chance to get it. So you do have to keep eating at the table until it actually pops for you. But most people get yeah, it in the first gotta... five minutes or something. Yeah, you got to sit down and eat and then switch chairs and then sit down and eat and switch chairs and then eventually it pops. It's kind of weird how it works, but yeah, it's funny. I mean, you have to, ha- it's a, the kind of thing I'm never going to use, but I had to go get it. Right? Exactly. Like, yeah. It's... I don't want to, you know, shape shift into a turkey. It's not really high on my list of priorities, <laughs> but I, I, I got to, you, you know, it's a limited time critter shape that you can acquire that is ridiculous. So I had to do it. And I mean, I have like a, a family of turkeys that live in the woods behind my house. And, oh. you know, I was kind of shooing them out of my backyard all spring and summer. <laughs> and they're weird looking creatures. You they know, are. no offense yeah. to the turkeys out there, but they're, they're just, they're strange. You know, they're, they're huge and they walk around like little dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, I think maybe, you know, maybe that's why the turkey critter shape is not for me. Cause it just, it reminds me of my, my friends that live in the woods back there. But, uh, yeah, it is the kind of thing you gotta you, you gotta go and do while it's still up. Well, maybe it'll help you commune with the turkeys in your backyard if you use That's the critter true. shape a bit more. I, I can I can become one with the turkeys. That's right. You can understand their plight and why they keep wandering into your backyard. All right. Uh, well, we're here not just to uh, to talk about us, but to talk about and talk with our patrons. So we actually have Shoral standing by. So I want to get Shoral in here as soon as we can, so that uh, Shoral's not waiting on us too long. All right. Well, let's unmute. Cheryl, how are you doing this evening? I am doing okay. Let me just mute. Sure. The, um, mute the stream because that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, I'm doing great. My wife is actually home, not off taking care of sick relatives. This is amazing. Oh, um, nice. I, Welcome I, back. Playing WoW, so I figured I could hop on. Excellent. Well, we always enjoy when our patrons are able to uh, stop in and actually chat with us live, not just have the, I know you submitted a question this week, but you get to actually ask it to us, which is even better. I do. I do. And I can answer it for myself too, for that matter. Okay. Um, so, but 
first to answer your question to everybody, which yeah. is, I think, what what are we excited about 9.2? Yeah, it's more of a discussion. It's not really a pointed question, but more of just, well, a, you, you know. know. 9.2 you know, first impressions, you know, anything stick out to you, anything you like or don't um, like. There is, there is one thing that has definitely stuck out to me, and I haven't looked at a lot. To be honest, I looked at the announcement video, and that's more or less all I've really paid a lot of attention to. Um, but what I am noticing is that we get a pretty end of expansion zone. Yep. Like, the zone that's we true. have to spend a year in is not all the same color. Like uh, the end of Legion, for example, like the Argus subzones, or I mean uh, the Argus subzones. I mean even Ice Crown in Wrath. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and it, you know the Nightmare zones in like the Nihilotha zones in oh, A3 yeah. were like they had some some variety to a degree, but all, you know you were spending time in there when they were dark purple and everything was being invaded right. by Nihilotha. Right. Um, so let's see, that's BFA and Legion. And let's see, before Legion was, uh, I mean, Tanan Jungle was okay <clears throat> in terms of not being. Some sub zone variety, yeah. Some, some sub zone variety. Um, Timeless Isle was fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was where yeah. they first got into the, uh, you know, timed events and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and right. Game zone. I found Timeless right, so, Isle was weird to navigate. That was the thing for me about Timeless Isle was like trying to, because there was the, the very, very, very low area and then the very, very, very high area and trying to get between them. There was like one or two routes that actually yeah. worked. And often you're like, I right. need to get to there. But to get there, I have to do this very weird, obscure, looping, ginormous path to get over to that spot. Right. 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 So, but it'll be nice, I think, to have a zone that has some variation in mobs and in in uh what that zone actually looks like for the who knows how long we're gonna be in that <laughs> zone um so that's the that was the thing that uh leapt out to me yeah um about the zone yeah the, the, um, the other thing i was sort of hinting at there a bit is we'll have flying in that zone too so you'll be able to enjoy it not just it's not just a zone that's designed from ground level but you actually those pretty views you're talking about you'll get to see from above too yeah, those and that should be a lot of fun as well. So that's that was kind of what I thought of the your question. Now my question to you, um, we're getting a split raid this time, and it's a, not a super long split in the raid, but it made me think about, and we discussed this a little bit in the Discord, <laughs> about it. It made me think about those little one or two boss raids that we've gotten in many expansions. Um, and I think this is kind of an interesting spin on that idea with having a raid that's bigger with some bosses at the end that are kind of split away. And I wanted to know if you were going to design something like that for an end of expansion raiding scenario, um, what how you would design something like that intentionally like a lot of people are talking about they don't think that this raid design is necessarily intentional what they had in mind way back when they released 9.0 right um we know they know what the raids are going to be if not the details of the raid is well before the release of the beginning of the expansion right so um, so that, that was kind of my question. What do you think would be a cool way? Cause I think this could something like that could be a cool way to make the long tail of the expansion a little less, uh, boring, honestly. Yeah. So, so just to clarify what you're talking about is not just having a, a one week difference in the bosses that we have access to, but having a, a more prolonged release schedule for that. So that you can actually space it out a bit more? Is that, that what you're sort of getting? Either something like that, or maybe even putting a small raid two months after right. the launch of the patch that's intended to be after, like, you go in and you attack this location, right? And we kill a bunch of bosses, and maybe the, quote, end boss of the raid runs away. Right. 
Right. You know, or we have to break down a barrier or they weren't actually where we thought they were. Right. Yeah, so the so the capstone happens later. Yeah, I get that. Right. Yeah. So I um, I chance is there sorry, I just want to interrupt. Is there more? Is there No, no, there's okay. I didn't have any more. So to answer that, I guess for me, um is I mean, I love the idea of having that. And we know that and as sort of you hinted at, there's been a lot of conversation around Anduin was initially the 9.2 end boss, and then the jailer was the 9.3 end boss. And so they um, decided to mush them into one raid because we're dropping 9.3 if that's what's happening. Um, and that uh, sort of the, the suggestion you're having, which I actually think is kind of a neat one too, is if they'd done... Um, the Anduin fight being the final boss for this raid tier and then released a three boss tier that was the capstone to the expansion that came out four months later or three months later that uh, was something that you could go in and experience. And they've done that a, a few times in, in expansions, but never with story-based things. Um, we've had uh, individual bosses come out right at the tail end of an expansion as a one-boss raid or a two-boss raid um, kind of uh, situation. I, I just, just for me, Wrath of Lich King pops out as the the big one with the red dragon. You'd portal into, and there was an upstairs downstairs phase um, with spinning cutters that I drove me insane. Um, but uh, yeah, that that boss stands out to me. But that wasn't like a big story point, right? That wasn't a boss where there was like, oh, this is really tying in the Lich King story. It was a here's a piece of content to sort of tide you guys over a little bit. Uh, during the the lull of the expansion, and I I do like the idea of tying it in uh, with a raid tier, um, and I do like the idea of that all happening within the same patch. Uh, I think I think Blizzard's very set and have been in their release schedule of when a new patch comes out, all of the content for that patch that is major content happens in the first three weeks, and then after that you might get a trickle of a little tiny bonus thing here or there, but nothing substantial after those first three weeks. That is the content that you're getting and feel free to explore it. Some things might be gated behind reputation or something for you earning or achieving something, but nothing large story related would be gated like that. Um, I know in Legion, we had the, the every two week quest chain that came out with Nighthold for a little while. Um, and that was cool. And that had some lore to it and it had some impact to it. Um, I, I don't feel like that was, um, uh, as interesting as if they'd sort of released the whole storyline at the same time. I think that was a reason to try and keep people logging in every two weeks, but I don't think it was as impactful as if they'd released that story partway through as more of a, a secondary, you know, content chunk. Um, so I, I like the idea personally of going, Hey, you know what? Here's the first eight bosses of this raid zone. Um, you're going to be able to do those first eight bosses. This was going to be the, the 9.2 raid. We designed these other three bosses as part of the 9.3 raid, um, and we'd release that capstone a couple months later or a few months later, and you guys can do the three boss raid then um, as content that you can do. Um, I, I think the only uh, sort of impacting factor there is whether or not once those three bosses came out, and I don't know if this is a problem or not, but it's something that I could see happening, raid teams would go, okay, I'm we're done with the first eight, we're just going to do these three. It's now old content, right? There's that concept of once something's come out and something else comes out after it, the thing that previously came out is now old and no one wants to do it. Everyone wants to do the new thing. And the new thing becomes what everyone's focus is on and no one goes back to the old thing. Um, so even if right. the item levels for the gear were close, I feel like there's a, a mentality shift that would need to, Blizzard would need to nurture in their audience to try and shift people over away from just because this thing came out before this other thing doesn't mean the previous thing is now obsolete in comparison, right? Or that this new thing should somehow completely replace all of your gear that you were previously wearing um, in how they're delivering all of the, the content to you. So, right. I, um, I mean, I think of, I think of um, ways to deal with that is like, um, Anixia was a one boss raid. It had the helm from the tier two set. Yep. So it made it valuable while you were doing tier two to still go back and do Anixia. And I don't like, like, they also had the pants, I think it was, from tier two dropped off of Ragnaros. Yes, there Which was something weird like that. I don't like, like that, yeah. that because, like, having to do 10 bosses that you need no gear from to get a shot at 
two or three pieces of gear to complete people's sets. I don't like that. I think personally, there, I think there'd be a big push against them going, Hey, you know what? We're going to have the jailer drop your helm for your tier set. And there's five pieces to it. So you don't technically need the helm, but it suddenly limits people's ability to actually get their four piece together by gating something like that. Um, yeah, now, now there's, there's other systems they put in to sort of help with that, with the mythic plus stuff and all that. Um, right. So I, I, at least there's, there's that sort of compensation for it. I just feel like there would be an upcry, but I want to let Jason dig in on this a little bit before I keep going. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, like, okay, so in my ideal world, right, the final tier of an expansion would last about nine months, right? And what would be cool is if there could be some kind of drop like a third of the way or halfway into that that would spice it up a little bit. So we're not just doing the same farm for that entire nine months. Um, you know, we're kind of conditioned as players to have that like big kind of climactic final boss battle for the patch the tier the season whatever you want to call it and then we wait until the next huge kind of content explosion happens and i think that would be kind of hard to break obviously like they like to tie this in with the story of the game and have these create these big you know story moments especially going back to like wrath of the lich king at least i, I think that's really where that kind of sort of started and and they've kind of continued in that tradition of like okay you face off against this you know big bad and then your reward is this cinematic that kind of ties up this part of the story and maybe teases some future part of the story and you know they've been doing that for a really long time now um and that was the expansion where they did ruby sanctum which i think was kind of a failed experiment you know i mean ice crown citadel was current content for about 11 months i want to say like that that tale of wrath of lich king lasted a really long time that was basically all of 2010 right it came out in december 09 and that was current content up until very early december 2010 when when cataclysm came out so that was that was it you know and and they they did the ruby sanctum thing it wasn't like a particularly well-loved encounter and it's not like it added a ton of desirable loot to the system and um you know we've seen them revisit this with a couple uh, a couple instances over the years in Legion, they did Trial of Valor, which I think was a really cool instance. It had three pretty cool bosses in it, had some cool loot, had some transmog sets. Um, it came in at a time where we didn't really need it, though, because it, you know, what uh, Emerald Nightmare came out in uh, late, very late August, very early September of 2016. And then Trial of Valor came out in like November or something that year. Trial of Valor was out like not very long after that and then we're in the night hole by like january so that that kind of rapid fire release schedule at the beginning of legion seemed kind of unnecessary considering how long you know the tale of the expansion was and then in bfa they did the kind of mini raid concept with crucible of storms which was a very strange raid i think it was yeah. cool it was wacky you had it was very outside the box the gear was weird you had to a lot you of had kiss to curse. Kind of, yeah yeah you had to step outside of your comfort zone to do a lot of the boss mechanics it was only two bosses but the bosses and the trash were all very strange and that was another one that it came out like kind of right on the heels of um battle for desire lore which had come out in january of 19 and then i think crucible came out in like april so Desarlor was still pretty new. It wasn't. I mean, it, it, it's, it was. It, yeah, it was like halfway through. It came out the and, week after we killed Mythic Jaina, and I was in a. Right. We, were, we were like U.S. 80th or our 70th or something. Right. And it was right. the week after we killed Jaina that came out. Yeah, we killed heroic Jaina like two weeks after it came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Desarlor was still pretty fresh when Crucible came out, and then that was only about three months before. Um, Eternal Palace came out, so that was slotted in, in a you know in a not great place. It would that would have been a great kind of chaser to the whole expansion of raiding after Nihilotha, but it wouldn't have made any sense in the story. So that you know that presents kind of a of a it'd be it'd be a little incongruous, right? Like you defeat Nizoth, you channel the heart of of Azeroth to you know destroy Nihilotha, or at least as far as we know at this point, like end the threat of Nihilotha for the time being. 
And then you go back underneath Shrine of the Storm and there's some squid faced dudes doing some Nihilotha stuff down there like that. You know, it, it would have just been a little bit weird. I, I, I mean, I think you could you could ad- adopt kind of that model and maybe tease stuff that we'd be fighting in the next expansion, maybe. Like, it's not like we don't know that it's not like Team Two doesn't know what we're going to be stepping into early in the following expansion, right? So maybe something that sort of sets the stage for the next expansion would be the way to go and get like get that mini raid or get some story beat that uh, like Shoral mentioned kind of, you know, the boss escapes or whatever. We got to go fight him on some different turf or whatever in another instance and just add this little, add add a little wrinkle to the, that last year of raiding um, before we move on. It's, it's tough because we are, you know, we're conditioned for these ebbs and flows, these peaks and valleys of like, okay, we're building all the way up to, you know, we're spending the entirety of Shadowlands building up to this jailer fight, right? Like we've known that from the beginning. He was front and center and the marketing is the bad guy. And the whole story is, is basically the Shadowlands uniting against the threat of the jailer. So it's like, okay, the, the entire thrust of the story is building up to this fight. So if we fight and defeat him and then a couple months later, some other thing comes out where we're fighting a different thing, that might be weird <laughs> Like that's just but, not that's not what we're, what we're used to. But I mean, I don't think it that matters that much. I, th- I think there's ways you could you could couch it in, you know, to uh, like a to be continued thing or some kind of right. next chapter after that that leads but, into the next. But expansion. I mean, if you if you think about it, if you think about take the um the Crucible of Storms uh, raid. That two boss raid. What if it had happened at the end of Legion? Yeah. Or not at the end. Yeah, at the end of Legion. Like, we're expecting to go to war with the Horde, and now we're talking about old god stuff? Yeah, What's going I mean, on? It would have set know? the stage for BFA a lot better, actually. Yeah, would have. Yeah. It would have. It would, well, and Blizzard would have had to have been able to accept, hey, we're going to be dealing with old gods and we're going to tell everyone they're going to be dealing with old gods and it's not some secret thing that we're trying to like hint at throughout the expansion which is what they were doing they're playing coy through most of bfa whereas at least if they'd um put that right out where they did they could actually be directly hinting towards hey this is very much old god related sort of stuff that you're going to be dealing with and i think that would have been a lot more exciting and i think it would have been a really neat kicker at the end of the expansion to, to dive into that or even I almost wish that they do a micro raid like that during the um, pre-patch cycle when we get the .o oh, yeah. cycle, right? Of of being like, we're going to release a, rela- a raid during this, and then you could that's something for everyone to sort of dive into for the month that we're you know in this or even longer than we're in, that we're in this pre-patch for that rolls out of relevance by the time the next raid tier sort of comes up and people are doing that. Um, right, would be kind of neat. And too. it could be you could even do some interesting things with. Like giving people pieces of gear that matter to, like, like, like pieces of gear that could potentially, like, like imagine a pre legion, a pre if they had done like a pre legion raid where you maybe started getting uh, artifact power. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, something that we carry forward into the leveling process. Yeah. Right, yeah. And that would, that would Some, be cool. Yeah, it would also be a lot more accessible for people who are coming in specifically to check out the pre-expansion or the new expansion. Like, if you're a regular raider, you have a ton of gear that you're carrying forward through the leveling process. You're probably not discarding your gear until, you know, end game, max level yep. quests at least. So this would be a chance for people who didn't put that investment in a prior expansion to you know make some meaningful progress on their character while we're in that weird holding pattern i mean i think there's a lot of potential there it's just something they never explored it's that it's that hey when we deliver you a new content patch we give you everything up front and it, it's that question of would they ever move towards a design point where they go you know what we're gonna give you a, a, a good amount of stuff up front but we're gonna hold back this one chunk till we're about two months or three months into it and we're going to give you that second chunk, which means you get something new content-wise partway through that patch cycle so that you actually have something to, to sort of freshen things up a bit more. 
Um, I, I know for a lot of raid teams that do world first stuff and do very high end stuff, they sort of crush all the raid content very early and then they take five months off, right? Their, their off time is logging in and doing split farming for some of those teams, other teams, they just have people who are very seasonal players who come back, do the push at the start of the expansion or the start of a content cycle, do the raid uh, progression and then disappear for a chunk of time. And, and that's how they actually um, raid and how they play the game. And so I, I feel like anything that keeps people feeling like the next thing is just around the corner is great because that's what you're looking for. As soon as that hype and excitement for that initial chunk of content starts to wear off, if you have a, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll still want to log in and do my dailies because we're only eight weeks away from the next thing dropping would be, that'd be cool. Right. Like that would be a, yeah. a, an enticing thing to put in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, like I, other, other MMOs do stuff with like their last, you know, like their dot three dot five patch. Um, whatever, somewhere in that range where it is literally an introduction to the next expansion. Yeah, I haven't played yeah, enough we, we other We've never really ones. seen anything like that that's like not tied to... I mean, there was a little bit in Legion, but that was very late in the process. And, I, you know, there was a, there was that question in, um, in Silithus and stuff where it sort of introduced the concept. But, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it does seem weird because for you know, like the better part of a decade now, we've had this sort of continuity narratively between expansions, but the stuff that we do, like most of the time, we're just locked into basically a year or so of a very similar gameplay loop and content once that final patch comes out. So, yeah, um, it would be, yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest experiment they tried to shake it up was still Ruby Sanctum and that really didn't work out too well, but that's not a reason not to try stuff in the future. Yeah. Like just don't do another Ruby Sanctum, come up with something that feels a bit more impactful and interesting to players. And I think that yeah. could be, that could really, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of people who just want to play the game every week and hang out with their in-game friends and kill bosses and whatever. And um, I, I think just assuming that they're going to either, be happy with the same content every week for a year or longer or just walk away until new stuff comes out. I, I don't think either one of those things really serve that type of player. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, I would, I personally would like to see something happen in that period of time, basically between uh, the, not really between the release, but, between when most people have finished what they're going to do in an expansion. That three months, and, that first three months. Yeah. Um, three, I mean, three to three to four months, depending on, you know, like uh, slower, lower level raid teams. My raid team only raids a couple of days a week. So like we haven't finished clearing normal yet, which is fine. Which is fine. I, I, what I'm emphasizing is the amount of stuff that you do outside of raid. That's sort of typically when I start seeing raid logging happen for even some of those those less the the lower progression, lower difficulty teams is the word I'm looking for. Um, yeah, is that's true. Like the the enticement to log in and do a dungeon or log in and do some farming or do this quest or whatever it is. A lot of that stuff starts to either get finished off or go away when we start hitting that three, three and a half month, as you said, sort of four month period of time um, yep. for a lot of teams. Yep. I would agree with that. Um, uh, you know, just something, something different, something else to do yeah. that um, helps make people want to stay because, you know, one of the things, one of the things that happens is if, if people get bored and stop logging in, some of them, one presumes, don't come back because, I mean, WoW is, you know, Jason has said this a number of times, WoW is a lifestyle game. Like, if you you have to fit it into your lifestyle to really get the most out of it as an MMO. Yeah. Um. You know, and and I mean, yeah, a lot of some people who play a lot of games probably take that downtime to go play the single player games they want to play. But 
how many of them don't come back? And how many of them would if there was just a little more to do that was interesting in that long tail? I would, I would even yeah, who do they take with them when they that's go? The, that's, you know, a lot yeah, of times that's what there's, I was there's doing. clicks inside of teams where it's like, yeah. well, these three people have all decided that they're going to play league for the next six months and maybe we'll see when the new patch comes out or whatever. And, you know, that can really, that can, that can kind of devastate your raid team. Yeah. And it's like you, when you're trying to get that like long term stability, it hurts. Uh, well, it's not any any person's fault. People should do whatever they want. But like, yeah, I, I think even just like two bosses just stashed in the last like three, four months of the expansion that have impact they had nothing story to do with the or, main or story. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just what even if they're out of left field, even if they're they're bosses that we know from previous, you know, expansions or encounters that they kind of repurpose and come up with some loose reason why we need to go fight them. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, something different to think about, a different uh, thing to approach and different rewards to get. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's what people who play WoW PvE really want. It's all we want, really. Like, the, the story is kind of secondary. Like, it's cool if it's if it fits and, it, and it's, like, interesting and relevant to what we want to do. But if we have cool bosses and, like, fun challenges to overcome, if the rewards come out the other side, then I think most of us are pretty happy. Yeah, I'd say that's probably accurate. Um, I mean, right now I'm running old dungeons. Yeah. For transmog. Sure. And you're filling out those, you, you got to either get those particular sets you're looking for, or you're trying to fill out those, uh, those, those blank categories in your transmog window, your costume folder. Make sure you right. fill them all up. I'm with you. Got to get ready for trial of style in March. You know, now's the time yeah. to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you got to think ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I am honestly think my paladin has too much transmog now, but you know. Yeah, like eventually it gets to the point of like, okay, how different are any of these clothes? That's from yeah, that's clothes? okay. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely hit that point with transmogs where I'm like, okay, I have this set of shoulders in five different colorations. Right. At what point <laughs> do they just introduce dyes where I can just essentially right click on something and choose a coloration for it, as opposed to having five separate individual things I'm clicking on. They did that I, uh, that same interface for um, druids when they were shape-shifting into different bear forms. You'd have a bear form, and then you had different. You could right-click and do different colorations of that bear form, and that gave you some different options. And I, I feel like their transmog update uh, to their the window frame that they've done recently is good, but I feel like that's certainly something I'd appreciate, is give me the one piece of gear, and then let me right-click on it and have a bunch of colorations that I have for that piece of gear to pick from as opposed to just being like, here's shoulders and you have 300 items in this window and 150 of them are actually different. Everything else is just duplicates of the same thing in different colors. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's little tweaks like that, that it'd be nice. Um, but you know, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, if, if that's the last question, do you have another question? I do not have any more right. questions. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. This has been You're fun. You're welcome. Gestural, thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out. Yeah. Always yeah. a pleasure. And thanks for the support and and yeah, it's always it's always nice to hear from you. It's a it's a great show. I really love it. So and and you know and I I'm going to say one more thing. Sure. Every time you guys open your mouths about various things going on in gaming at large or in in the business side of things, I just like you better. <laughs> Well, oh. you know, it's it's murky kind of waters to navigate as a video game consumer, isn't it? Like, right? There, that you know, you can make an argument uh, that there is no such thing as ethical consumption, and in some ways, I do believe that it's it, it certainly applies to video games. Video games are very hard to ethically consume from the ground up. You need hardware to play them on. How does that hardware get produced? Exactly. Yeah. Um, right. You know, these are these are all difficult things to struggle with. There's not a lot I can do about this as a human being. You know, I don't have any influence over world markets and, and things like this. I do like video games make me happy. And, um, you know, I try to inject joy into my life where I can get it. But, um, you know, we do have this platform where people want to, like, engage with WoW about WoW with us. And I think it's, you know, it's our duty kind of to have this stuff front and center on the show and talk about. You know, I mean, I mean the, the people who make this game that we love have suffered for it, you know, plain and simple. And 
continue to. And we're going to continue to highlight it as long as they have stuff to tell us about it. And as long as they have, you know, a battle to fight in, in that regard, then we're on their side. We want the game to be awesome and the game will be awesome. It'll be as good as it can be when the people working on it are happy and supported and have what they need, you know? And right. It just makes you think like how, how much has been lost because of the way that these employees tend to be treated, compensated, how many people have gotten like kind of shouted out of rooms that had good ideas and how many people that were making good contributions weren't being paid enough to justify staying in in the company, staying in the industry. You know, how much talent has been shoved at a game dev as a whole because of this? You know, we know it's right. not one studio, one company. It's not even one corner of the industry. And it shouldn't be that way, you know, and I, I think it definitely hurts us as players in a, in a, in a real way, you know, the game would be, the, any game would be better if these weren't the conditions that people were producing games under. So. Right. Right. And I mean, and I think about it and I think about things like, you know, if, you know, what good ideas are just not being heard. Yeah. Um, you know, what are pe you know, you get told no, you 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 don't have good ideas directly uh right. too often and you stop bringing up ideas whether you think they're good or not i mean i work in a i work in the banking industry which is highly regulated and sometimes people come to and and i work in a position where i actually have some say in how we do our job um and sometimes someone brand new will come to me and say, well, why do we do this this way? Why can't we do this this other way? It would be a lot easier. And it, I never tell them that's a bad idea. Like the most important thing is not to, is to say not to say that's a bad idea. Or to say no Instead, immediately. Yeah. Right. Or to say no immediately. I mean, sometimes, yes, the appropriate thing is to say no immediately <laughs> in a highly regulated industry, but... But, but right, sometimes but, someone's got to learn the ropes. Like this is not how this business works. Right, but uh, but I try to couch it in. We can't do it that way because this yeah. regulation requires that we have this piece of information. That's why we do it this way. We get that piece of information, then we move on. <laughs> yeah, I I received um I received feedback once at, at one of my early jobs uh that they really disliked why th me asking why a lot of the time apparently I was, i'm part of generation y of just trying to un like i want to know why i'm doing something i want to understand why something is the way it is and uh I, someone was very negative to me about me asking questions they asked me to do something and i wanted to understand what it was i was exactly doing and why i was doing it so that i could in my opinion so i could do it the proper way right if if i right. know why i need to hang a light a certain way then I know that I'm doing it properly when I'm doing it because if it needs to shine upstage or downstage, it needs to be hung a different way kind of thing, right? So why am I doing this, right? Um, and inside their situation, it was, no, I just want you to do it. Like, just take this and go do it. And I'm telling you to go do it. And that's that was their perspective on how to do it. And I think it's, I've always felt it was very important to even when you are saying no to something that someone's suggesting, you give the why as to why that wouldn't be a thing that would work. Because otherwise, it's you're you're just shutting them down. You're not giving them any room for further creativity on the subject. If they understand, oh, I can't do it because of X, Y, Z, they can then start looking at that problem from a different direction. Because now they right. know that X, Y, Z is a barrier. So I I, I think it's it's really important that you uh, when when you do um, have creativity come up inside a workplace or any kind of environment that it's fostered in a way that even when you're saying no to it you're opening a door of them understanding why you're saying no to it. So if they want to keep chasing it, they can. Right. Right. I mean, and, and we've had, you know, I mean, in the past, you know, we've had some people who brand new to the job come up with things that completely transformed how we do our work because, because they said, well, because the literally just because they asked why, they're like, why do you do this? Why is it so important that you do this thing before you do that thing? Why is, you know, and, and it's, and I, you know, and I worry that, that 
in more creative industries than the one I work in. Uh, <laughs> you know, where you want people coming up with creative solutions all the time, what that does, right? Mm -hmm. Especially like on WoW. And I think, you know, Ian has spoken to this recently in some press that he's done. You know, WoW development over the last, I mean, WoW entered development in 1999. Um, it, you know, it's coming up on 23 years of development. Like there, there's a longstanding tradition that they do things the way they do them because that's the way they're done. You know, and I think 915 was seeing the first kind of bits of that being broken up and, and a little bit of a different philosophy or perspective coming in. And I think we're seeing more of that in 92 and, you know, they seem willing to re-examine this stuff going forward, and you know, with the next expansion and beyond. And uh, I mean, I think it's really important. You know, WoW isn't the same game that it was in 2004, and a lot of people don't play it the same way, don't want to play it the same way that they played it in previous years, previous eras of the game. And, you know, I think like re-examining why they cling to certain design philosophies that the player base doesn't seem to mesh with. I mean, I think those are really important things. And you know, I, I think that there's no way on the outside to look at that and go, well, that has nothing to do with like the shakeup at Blizzard and, you know, all of this other news that's that we're hearing about and these initiatives that we're seeing the employees take. Like you have to think that part of the reason why these changes are happening is in the game is because of this stuff going on at the company and team two sort of, you know rallying around each other in in the wake of this stuff and figuring out right. new ways to communicate and and maybe opening up some some new avenues for development because of that like i maybe that's not the case but uh, like from the outside there's no way that to i, I don't think there's any way it doesn't seem apparent right like right those those things seem linked together they really do yeah well thank you very much Cheryl. i hope you have a wonderful evening I should. Well, I'm just going to hang out, listen to you guys, and play WoW. Awesome. That, that sounds that's pretty a good. good plan. Yeah. I, mean, I can't. I can't hey. listen to myself uh, on a podcast, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> other than that, it sounds great. All right. You um, guys have a good evening. You too. Thanks, Thanks again for the Thanks, support. Cheryl. Thanks again for tuning in. Yeah, appreciate you. Have a good one. All right. We are going to jump into our next write-in, um, but before we do. I, I recognized when we were chatting with Cheryl there, we didn't actually cover the thing we normally do, Jason, which is answering our own question. So I want to answer our own question on what are we most That's optimistic ab about for That's true. For this. Because I, I, we broke format, and I want to be sure that uh, we get that in. So um, for me, as far as the positivity, I, I think it, it always is when we have a sit-down chat with a dev or we hear from a dev in, in another interview, um, is their level of excitement for the content. And Morgan was very excited for the content that was coming out. And it felt like he yeah, just, that's for sure. it felt like he could talk for eight hours if, if we had the time to let him do it about all the things mm -hmm. that he was pumped for and that he was excited for and the ideas they have. And for me, we I pretty much did like an hour long lightning round with him. Like yeah. he talked about so many different elements of the patch in in that hour window or so, not yeah. even a full hour. Yeah. So for me, the, 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 I guess the thing I'm most optimistic for is, um, the level of excitement that the developers and the team have about this patch that's coming up and how open and fluid they still are to new ideas coming in, um, discussing things like the great vault and, you know, what they could do to improve that, the freeze system he mentioned, um, those sorts of things I, I always are great for me to hear from a, a player perspective because it really means that they it's 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 that insight into things not being really rigid and the team really listening to a lot of different ideas and really bouncing a lot of different thoughts off each other to come up with a product that they really are happy with and passionate about and so when you get glimpses behind the curtain into oh yeah, we've totally thought about that and we've totally talked about that and we're excited for this and we've had this suggestion and that suggestion was cool and we're thinking about this and that's a good idea. We're kind of pumped up about that. Like that kind of positivity and energy and and um, openness to new ideas that could improve player experience and, and make the game better overall, I think is great. It's just really refreshing to get a taste of that every now and then. And it's very easy in these sort of periods of time where there's a big lull happening to feel like that isn't there 
right? That that passion and that excitement isn't there. You forget about it or it isn't, um, it, it isn't present enough for you to really feed off it or, or enjoy it. Uh, and so I, I'm, and I gain, I gain that what I'm most optimistic for, I guess, about 9.2 content is that the devs are really committed to making this a very fun chunk of content for people that has a lot of, you know, over open account use. So it's, you know, a, a shared, shared account stuff, account wide stuff. It has a lot of, um, uh, fun cosmetics to chase and reputations to chase that don't involve player power so that they are a little bit more open to, Hey, if you want to do this, you can, it's not something that feels like a chore for anyone. Um, it's a raid that has a lot of skips in it. It's, a uh, um, a lot, whole new crafting sort of system in the zone. It's got a talent tree in the zone. It's got like, they're, they're really trying to tap into what's going to make this fun for players. And so I'm pretty optimistic just based off the chat that I, we got to have with Morgan. Yeah. I, you know, I, th I think the initial reveal video honestly was pretty flat for me. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you know, I get it. I'm not, you know, this is this is pretty much by the numbers, like exactly what I would expect out of this. And you know, the, my expectations are are low at this point for Shadowlands, right? So um, that said, I mean, you know, I I talk a lot about how like I don't really care about the story necessarily. Like the story's cool if it's cool, but it's not like it's not like my main. It's not the reason I play the game to see that next chunk of story, right? Like, right. like the next chapter of the soap opera. Like I don't care about that I, I do think the game loses something for me and for a lot of players when we're detached from azeroth and then that continues to be the case in this patch but um you know it is it's you know we know it's wrapping up the the whole shadowlands story you know we're going to sort of the logical end point of that so that kind of makes sense um yeah i i, I mean I, I think they're just making um a lot of decisions. I don't think there's one particular thing that stands out at me that like, oh yeah, I can't wait for that element of 9.2. But I, I do think that they're making decisions that really indicate that they're aware of, they're sensitive to, you know, the issues that we've had over the last year or so with the game and and the things that really haven't worked, the kind of failed experiments and, and they're they're trying it sounds like they're trying to bake in a lot of stuff in 92 that will avoid those pitfalls for people and i think that that is really important so yeah i don't know i don't i i'm i'm of two minds about 9.2 because i personally there's nothing about it that really speaks to me but i do think that they're doing a bunch of really good stuff for the overall health of the game and I think for people that have probably a different play style than mine, you know, that aren't so laser focused on like a character and maxing the character out and doing a whole lap of whatever is in front of you every day until you get to a point where that stops paying any kind of dividend. Like I know there are other people that like to play that way, you know, but yeah. there are many, many more people that do not. So um, I, I think the stuff they're doing is more palatable to a wider array of players and that should result in a better experience for me because more of my friends should want to hang out and play if they feel like they're getting um, a bigger return on their time investment so i think that's vital to the health and, and future of wow is making it feel like a thing that is valuable to players right like you have a lot of options for your time these days. You got a lot of places that fifteen bucks a month could go to, um, and you know I don't I I, I think for me it's uh, I, I've never reached a point where it's like I don't want to play WoW at all for an extended period of time in the last you know decade or so, um, but I get why why people do. Um, I don't think there's any any like singular decision or even set of decisions they could make that would like stop people from rotating out, you know, as much as we see in the modern game, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't try to appeal to people, you know, and, and add these add kind of support for these types of play styles where it's like, what I really want to do is have, you know, five different tunes I can swap between at a moment's notice, depending on what I feel like doing and who I'm playing with and the content that I'm doing. Um, I do think there's a line to walk where it's like, are, are you know, 
some things do need to be tied to the character otherwise you're sort of playing like a pve moba or something right where it's like you're just picking a loadout and then going and doing a thing um so you know there the, there does have to be some things that are intrinsic to a character but you know content that's not necessarily designed to be uh, repeatable shall we say that ends up having to be repeated on every character in your stable that i think that's that's sort of uh, one of the big places where problems occur, you know, having, having to redo a ton of story questing to get to the same endpoint, or having to redo this sort of linear progression path through a, you know, a single player system that can be kind of a drag dungeons, raids, PVP, that stuff is supposed to be repeatable. So if you have to do a bunch of dungeons on your second character to get some gear, well, that's kind of the point of playing the game, right? So there, there, there does have to be a line where it's like, okay, this this is intrinsic to your character, but this is this unlocks on your account. Like, I, I, I think moving more stuff into that realm is, is a plus, even if it doesn't it doesn't really speak to me at this point in my WoW career so much. Um, maybe in a future expansion, it might do so a bit more. So um, if that's going to be the new direction, I think it's great. Yeah. No. All right. Now that we've not let ourselves off the hook on answering that, uh, let's jump into the next question, which comes in from Adam and Wow. And first he answers, or they answer ours, which is, I'm quite optimistic that I'll really enjoy the 902 content. The open world stuff looks really good. Hope the cipher turns out good. Getting tier sets with it sounds good uh, and still gives raiders an incentive to raid for early acquisition. Uh, I hope they all so I hope they make all this stuff as alt friendly as promised. Yeah, so I mean it's very similar to how we're feeling at the moment, which is great. Um, the question that Adam and Wow puts to us is: Do you think nine not two will have an impact on the player numbers? From my friends list, some people have been giving Shadowlands a second shot, but I'm not sure if that's an overall trend. Uh, I mean, I, I think if your friends list is showing more people playing the game since 9.1.5 dropped. I think that's probably a trend. Um, I think there are more people who came back when that new patch dropped, checked it out to see what's going on with it. Whether or not they stayed with it is still up in the air, depending on what their playstyle was. Um, I think if your playstyle was, I'm waiting for 9.1.5 because there's X quality of life thing that I've been looking forward to, you probably came back and jumped in and started playing the game a lot more. I think if you're waiting for 9.1.5 to jump in because you feel like there's going to be some sort of new content there, that wasn't something that's going to keep you around for more than a week or two when it came to sort of, you know, playing around with, with quests and new unlocks and that kind of stuff that came out. Uh, it certainly doesn't have a lot of staying power as a patch. So obviously with the PTR dropping, hopefully this next week, and then us moving into hopefully new content in early 2022, um, for patch 9.2, I think that is that is what's going to bring people back. I, I do think that that last patch, you'll see the resurgence of players who want to check out the new raid. You'll see a resurgence of players who want to check out the new zone and see the new zone and collect the pets and do the mounts and et cetera, et cetera. It's the staying power that's the, always been the big thing for World of Warcraft. They can release content and have a whole bunch of people log in to check it out. We've seen it time and time again when the game was in a really bad spot that they go, hey, here's, you know, new X big content release, whether it's expansion or patch, and a whole bunch of people come back and check it out. It's just how long do those people stay regularly playing the game, which is, I guess, why when Jason and I talk, we often focus on what's our loop, what's our sort of daily loop of content that we get excited for that keeps us logging in every day to keep playing the game. And if there isn't something super exciting as far as that daily loop goes, even us as content creators start to sort of lose interest in really jumping in and diving into the game on a daily basis. And it sort of becomes a, okay, what's the couple of chores I want to get done as opposed to, Hey, I'm, I'm excited or I, I find this very chill or enjoyable. It's an enjoyable experience to log in and do this loop. Uh, so I, I feel like 9.2 will need to have that fun loop. It'll need to have something where even if it's not about gaining character power, it's about working towards an unlock or an achievement or a purchasable that is exciting and that you want to be working towards and that that loop is not a big slog that's a, a total pain and really unfun to do but is actually kind of enjoyable gameplay to to participate in um you can think of a, a great example with uh um Corthia being one of those zones where it just filled your inventory with items 
so quickly that immediately you're like, this is a pain. This is a total pain. I don't enjoy that my bags just get really full of all these things. I have to keep going back and turning them all in. I'm not getting a lot of reputation for them. I'm not getting a lot of, you know, currency for them. This just isn't fun, right? Whereas if that reputation on its own and how you earned it and how much you earned had been done in a different way, I think you would have actually seen people look at that zone very differently. But because of how that reputation worked, I think that did affect people's staying power on farming it and putting time into it and putting effort into it. I think that I hundred percent, I think it did. So I, I think they need to nail that loop. Um, and that will be the staying power that we're looking for in 9.2. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely gonna be a bump when 9.2 comes out. Um, it's not going to be huge and it's probably going to tail off, um, you know, after the first few weeks, but, uh, it's it, will it have an impact? Yes. Will it be like a new expansion level? Will it be like a mini expansion? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think at this point, people, you know, people. Uh, the question is, what kind of bump is the next expansion going to have? Is that going to get back to like a, a more healthy feeling WoW population, or are people just gone? Um, and we don't know the answer to that yet. I, I mean, I think the people that have had a toe in Shadowlands one way or the other since last November. I do think we'll we'll see a bump in nine two, and you know if nine if nine dot two if word of mouth is strong, then I think you'll see more and more people trickle in, and I think people will hang out a bit longer. Word of mouth on nine one was horrible, even though I don't think that was warranted. I think nine dot one was a pretty good patch if you were caught up on a character and you were spending time on that character doing the stuff that nine dot one presented you to do. Um. It didn't resolve the fundamental issues that people already didn't like about Shadowlands, though, right? And um, the Archivist Codex rep was very controversial. I think, to some degree, it was a bit blown out of proportion, honestly. Like, because if you maxed out Corthia every day, there was very little variance in the total amount of rep and uh, research you were pulling in. The problem was most people don't want to max out Corthia every day. So they're going to have a lot of variance because maybe the 15 minutes they spend on Corthia are very lucrative one day and very, lu very not lucrative the next day. And that second day feels really bad. Whereas for me, it was like, okay, I'm just going to load up my add-ons and my weak aura and I'm going to do everything I can possibly do today. And then I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then I'm going to be done with this whole thing in a few weeks. Um, I get it. Like, I, I get why people don't want to do that, especially in the modern game. It's not the way many, many players want to play the game now. So, um, uh, but, you know, I, I think that that had a real blunting effect on 9.1's kind of impact to the overall player base because initial impressions were maybe a bit murky. The systems were kind of convoluted. And then a lot of voices in the content creation space were like, this RNG rep is terrible. It's ruining everything. Why did they do this? Blah, blah, blah. And um, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's no merit to that, but I'm also saying like as a very invested, you know, single player activity player, there was very, there was no RNG rep, like not, not on the scale at which I was doing the activities. So I don't know. The, the, the bottom line is they didn't put a good, they didn't put the best possible face on it in the game. And then word of mouth was poor. Um, nine dot two, I think already has better word of mouth and it's not even on PTR yet than any, anything anybody has played at Shadowlands since alpha, um, that will go a long way into getting people excited to check it out. The question will be, what is that initial kind of ramp up experience like in Zareth Mortis? Does it feel instantly engaging and rewarding or does it feel like, Hey, here's a bunch of systems getting thrown at me that don't make sense yet. And oh, I went and did a thing because they asked me to, but it didn't feel like I got the reward I was expecting. And now how do I feel about that? And then I do it tomorrow and I'm still in the same kind of spot. And now I'm raid logging for the next nine months. You know, it's, it, so it's it's hard to know what that's going to be like. But yeah, I, I, def I definitely think you'll see a, a bunch more of your friends popping on and stuff once once it's go time for 9-2. Um, people will want to check out how it, ends up and and how they stuck the landing with trying to bring this thing home and what the new you know the new systems to mess around with are like yeah yeah all right next question 
or at least uh, next answer comes in from Tramper Pard, who says, the part of 9.2 that I'm most optimistic about is the ability to create tier pieces to help with the bad luck and lack of master loot. Yes, I know the dead horse has been beaten, uh, but yes, okay. I know that there are not, I know that they are not doing um, what two legendaries were sort of hoping we'd be able to wear, uh, but what would it have opened up gameplay wise for you? Okay, so question for us is if we could wear two of any legendaries, what would that have actually opened up for us? Um, I, Jason, I'll let you go first on this one because I know it's way more impactful for you than it is for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because see, there's a uh, there's a legendary power for Prot Warrior called uh, Thunderlord. And at the outset of the expansion, Thunderlord was pretty good. It was it was our best choice for like AOE tanking. It's been supplanted um, since, uh, I, I think even before nine. It, it was a hot fix change to Reprisal, and Reprisal kind of became the de facto for situations where your big raid cooldown cooling down faster wasn't as important. Um, but so what Thunderlord does is every time you hit. Uh, an enemy with thunderclap it reduces the cd on demoralizing shout up to four and a half seconds so if you're hitting three targets with with thunderclap every eight seconds or whatever the cooldown on thunderclap is you're getting four and a half seconds of cdr on demo shout demo shout is a very powerful tool you know it's 20 percent damage reduction on all enemies within 10 yards for eight seconds on a 45 second cooldown um also, you talent into it frequently to uh, make it even more powerful, you know, increase that that uh, damage reduction on the enemies even more. Um, so you have a lot invested in Demo Shout anyway, and getting more Demo Shouts is really good. Um, this is very similar to the BFA playstyle, which really revolved around Avatar, Thunderclap, and Demo Shout. Those were kind of the three key elements of, of Prot Warrior throughout the, that entire expansion. So, um, you know, as, as much as I talk about wanting variety, I wanted to go back and, you know, have different play styles every patch or so, every season or so. Um, missing out on Thunderlord for most of this expansion has been kind of a letdown because I like that effect. Cooldown reduction is super fun for prot warrior it's usually tied to how much rage you're spending so the more throughput you have the more throughput you can generate and then you can cool your your abilities down faster and then your your uh your abilities tend to generate rage uh, you know or up your your baseline rage regen the ones that you're cooling down so it's really fun synergy right pushing your buttons is fun and that allows you to do that demo shout is such a great tool for damage reduction in aoe situations so um you know i was kind of hoping that i'd be able to use some kind of reprisal thunderlord combo or something uh for dungeons so you know what reprisal does is whenever you charge or intervene to a target it procs a free revenge um it also grants you a few seconds of uh um shield block so it's great for filling in gaps in your shield block uptime and also that revenge can proc a shield slam, which is damage and rage throughput. Um, you know, it's just it, basically you're doing a thing you want to be doing anyway, and you get awesome benefits for it. That'd be a super powerful combo with Thunderlord and with the extra demo shout up time. Um, unfortunately, that's obviously it's not going to be possible, but you so you can kind of see, I guess, Hopefully, for me rambling about the, the you know these powers and these synergies and combos in the playstyle, you can see why the fact that what I get is a thing that makes the button that I don't really think about that just does damage last longer and do more damage. That's not as interesting as having another piece in the arsenal that switches around my rotation, my priority potentially provides me with more options for cool. I mean, demo shot is basically like a mini cooldown. It, it's not as powerful as like a shield wall type effect, but it, it's still a pretty strong defensive effect. Um, it's not on a super long cooldown, but getting it to cool down even faster is very valuable. So um, yeah, you, you know, and the, it makes me think too, like they created so many, so many legendary powers per spec, right? Like there's, I don't know, I, I think for Prot Warrior, there's like 17 total or something. 
And, you know, most of them are so niche that they're borderline useless. You know, there's just powers nobody would ever use. But in the context where you have like kind of a build around power and then you can slot another one in, some of them might, you know, be able to find some breathing room or some way that they'd be valuable. I think like it makes sense in a lot of ways to just do the covenant legendary. You kind of pay off the whole covenant system that way. It's simpler for everybody. Everybody gets the same option and that's easier to balance and stuff. But um, man, from, from pretty much day one, I've been hoping and expecting I'd be able to combo some of these powerful defensive abilities together. So um, I, I do kind of, miss the days when when tanks were had to be more def- cautiously uh, defensive you know like had to invest more in playing defensively and it it was nowadays it's more like okay just don't completely mess up your active mitigation and then do as much damage as you possibly can and, and you're tanking like i would kind of like to see it go back the other way with this more technique to pulling positioning you know set setting up a pull for success and you know playing defensively in a way that made you feel like you were making good choices. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree that I think uh, the second legendary being any one of our choice for a lot of classes and specs would open up a lot of more options um, in how they play and where their focus is on their play and whether it is something more defensive or offensive or um, whatever it is you're trying to actually accomplish. Synergistic is another one that sort of uses a word. Um, for balanced druids, I think we were going to be using the covenant ones no matter what. Um, when it comes down right. to it, the uh, you know, ravenous frenzy one for Venthyr is just so freaking strong that unless they do huge balance passes, which I guess is the big caveat to answering anything about this question, is well, what are we going to see balancing wise from Blizzard when it comes to these classes? Because we're not going to see that for a month and a half or something like that, anyways. Um, so once that actually happens, that will certainly change up some people's ideas of potentially which covenant they're going to want to be playing and which legendaries they're going to want to be using. Um, but for me right now, if, you know, as, as the game is, uh, you'd be ravenous frenzy for sure. And you'd be using pulsar as your secondary to sort of fill in in the middle. Um, I think if I could use two of any, uh, I, I would much prefer to see almost like a, I almost prefer to do a Night Fae thing where I'm using Boat plus Pulsar so that I'm using the balance of all things, which every time I go into Celestial Alignment, I get a large crit increase for a short period of time at the start of it. And you tie that in with Pulsar so that you're going into that crit high crit increase regularly on a, on a fairly set rotation. You then have Convoke. Um, so not only are you essentially staying inside of um, your uh, Celestial Alignment for a long period of time, with your normal cast of it plus pulsar but you're also able to convoke uh whenever those are up and you're getting the additional crit at the front end of all your convokes um that that is attractive to me uh but honestly for people who are going to continue playing night fey having a one minute convoke versus a two minute convoke you can convoke every single minute even though it's half the you know it's only a four second convoke um which means technically you're have a, a lower chance of getting moons during your convoke, which is within that, you know, boat kind of window, if you're still using balance of all things, uh, makes it less attractive. Um, I, I still think boat plus pulsar wouldn't be as good as covenant legendary one minute convoke plus pulsar so that every single time you go into a pulsar, you can then convoke with your pulsar every single time. So that's, that would be what the night Fae ends up doing is you always have a celestial alignment empowered convoke. And what the Venthyr is doing is, you do your big damage the same way you do right now, except you also enter Celestial Alignment every chunk of time, which means your in-between damage is not totally useless like it currently is. Um, as it is right now, you do like 88% of your entire fight's damage in your three-minute cooldowns, and your 12% is the thing that's kind of in-between, and I think you'll see that change to being like 60 nine percent or 70 percent of your damage is done during your cooldowns and the other 30 percent is done in between is what you'll probably end up seeing so it won't be won't be like a it's massive funny. change but... so much better but it's still pretty off it's but still it'd be a way big improvement, off. yeah yeah it's it's just one of those interesting things where i it, it's interesting it's, it's strange to me for venthyr players because you actually can um 
Uh, it, it almost feels like there isn't a large difference if you blew all your cooldowns at the start of the fight and then died and then got rezzed before the three minute mark and used all your cooldowns again and then died again after it. That that is that is how the gameplay currently feels, where yeah. you're like, you know what? As long as you actually did your rotation correctly within those windows, you don't actually need to be alive for the next three minutes until those cooldowns are back up again. Um, <laughs> right. So you know that's fine. Uh, it it does mean on go do mechanics. Go yeah, do mechanics. exactly. It does mean on encounters uh, like remnant. You can throw the globes off the edge. Why? Because you're not losing any real DPS time by throwing the globes off the edge because you've already done your uh, your big damage inside your damage window. Uh, it means you can off heal, which is something I think is great on the Sylvanas fight. Where in a lot of a lot of times on that fight, I'll blow all my cooldowns, use all my cooldowns up properly, and then I'll use Heart of the Wild and go into Resto form and just start healing people left, right, and center because I'm not doing very much damage. And if there's a high intense damage phase happening where people are taking more damage than they normally would, or there's a situation where a healer has died and they need to sort of fill in a gap, especially in those last platforms. You blow all your cooldowns, you do a ton of damage, a healer's down, you then swap, you know, out of that and Heart of the Wild heal for the rest of that phase. It's great. Like, it's, you know, you, you've done a huge thing to yeah. support your team. So um, I, I like that That's a very thing to do, too, yeah. Yeah, it's just not something that looks attractive when you're looking at damage meters, because... We do so much. We do so much damage in that thirty-second window that you just sit at the top of the charts for the next minute because no one can catch up to you in that minute period of time. So it's it's a it's a weird it's a weird spec at the moment for sure. Yeah, you do bring up an interesting point though because like there are there are specs who are probably in my boat where it's like okay, well, I guess I have to use this thing even though I don't really care about what it's doing for me. Then there are specs where like the covenant legendary is currently the default so yeah. it's like okay what do what do i i'm, I'm kind of jealous of that side of the equation where it's like what do i get to pick to use with that like yeah. that seems like fun that's not where i live yeah and then yeah. i guess there are specs where it's like well the covenant legendary just doesn't uh it doesn't sim as high so i'm gonna take this other one and then it's like okay well this is a nice additive bonus i could take like the second or third best one or whatever and and add it in um, that's that's all pretty cool. And I'm sure there's plenty of tank players who are stoked about getting to, you know, use two legendaries. And, but for it just the, my philosophy and the way I like to play the game, the thing, like, I wasn't really stoked about the Covenant abilities to begin with because it's like they don't... They're, they're, it's not the same things we had in Legion where we had the artifact power, right? Like, the artifact power for Prot Warrior was awesome in Legion and it was very skill testing, right? Because it was a channel and having a channel power on a prot warrior is weird. But if you could figure out a way to use it, if you could time it out where you could plant for, for dur the duration of the channel, it was an extremely powerful ability. It added damage, yeah, it added some offense, but the defensive component was very strong. Um, and you know, the covenant abilities are not that it's just, okay. Here, here are stuff you basically don't think about. You drop it on the ground, essentially, and it does, it either does damage or it buffs you, or you know, one of them replaces execute with a more powerful version of it that you can use at the top and bottom of the fight. Like, it's it's nowhere near the the you know the same type of decision making and and tanking skill test that the Legion artifact ability was. So, it's um. Yeah, it, it's it's a bit difficult for me to get excited about it, but that doesn't mean that like nobody who plays tank is excited about it. It's just not my not my preference. Yeah, and, and that's why I sort of emphasize class balance too, because right now people who are pumped for you know the idea like you know, situation like me where it's like yeah, I just get to add another legendary to what I'm already doing. There's every possibility that once class balance and tuning comes in that changes in a big way. We have no idea. Like for all I know, I'll end up as Necrolord and I'll yeah. be doing dots on things. Like it's, we have <laughs> right. no idea what's going to end up happening when it comes to the balance pass that's going to happen. So I, I, I would, I, I would emphasize for people when they're looking at the tier set bonuses being data mined and we're, uh, we're looking at um, people's opinions on that and how it's going to affect your play. All of it is heavy grain of salt. This is very PTR. This is very testing base this is not we we don't have a full picture of what yeah. any of this is going to look like and from talking with morgan it doesn't sound like the devs have a full picture of exactly what this is going to look like yet they still want to get the ptr up hear people's feedback and make decisions on some of these things still so you know they've they've got their initial this is our initial idea but let's you know actually hear what the player base has to say and we're going to change some things so 
I would uh, I would not get too worried or caught up in what uh, the content creators out there are saying right now about what's your best and what's your worst and whatever. Definitely get out there and, and try it yourself if you want to do PTR or wait for others to try it. And you'll see a lot more feedback come in about how things are going to change and then see what changes. All right. Next one here is from Robert W2392. Uh, this is uh, a response to... Actually, it's not, there's no response to our question, but it is a question for us, which I do want to emphasize, which is, as someone who only finally got the, the domination piece I needed for my three-set bonus for Unholy Shards last week, I'm looking forward to the ability to craft, nine dot, uh, craft pieces in 9.2. Okay, so this does answer our question. Crafting pieces in 9.2, which should help against the above uh, really bad luck, which hits especially hard when the domination pieces are so important in Sanctum. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree that this is a very big benefit for a lot of the player base. Um, uh, we saw during the race even th the impact of what those shards for Unholy Shards would actually do. And that was with not massively optimal play. Like eventually, obviously, Sylvanas wise, there was much more time to get optimal play going for people using those sets. But a lot of people didn't even have their sets, uh, but the people who had them were substantially improved. So I, I definitely feel like being able to get tier set into people's hands in a guaranteed way, even if it takes two weeks for them to actually unlock the ability to start doing it or whatever period of time that is, I like always having the ability to work towards getting something. Um, I, I think uh, Titan Residium, Residium was a great sort of solution to that problem of I can either gamble or I can just consistently save and then buy the piece of gear that I'm really looking for. I think that's great. So yeah, I agree. All right, away from 9.2. With a lot of the talk about uh, around the end of Shadowlands, uh, we'll close a chapter of WoW. Do you think that the next expansion will finally bring cross-faction endgame content, as in raiding, etc.? Or, indeed, will there still be an alliance and horde come next expansion? Um, I really would be shocked. I would be shocked. I would be the jaw-dropped person at BlizzCon when they made the announcement, or whatever it is they're doing it, that there's cross-faction raiding. That is a on release, not an unlock, not a after Hall of Fame closes, not a whatever. Um, that that is going to become a thing. I, I would be shocked that they are that they started to do that. Um, I I feel like this is one of those systems with cross faction rating, where we will see them dip their toe into it first, and then maybe just a little bit of their foot, and then maybe a little bit of their ankle. Like it just like. They will slowly, slowly do this. I don't think we'll see a, guess what? The barriers are coming down. Here we go. Cross, cross faction ratings, a thing we're going, it'll be a, you can unlock it after hall of fame closes and it's going to be a mercenary mode. And there's going to be rules around loot and like some sort of restriction involved. And they'll go, okay, well you can do it, but you can only do it in non-mythic content or something like that. I don't know, you can do it, but you can only do it if, and they'll, they'll be, it'll be that for a while. That's the standard Blizzard way of doing things. Um, I don't feel like they'll just be like, yep, guess what, we're doing it. There's cross-faction rating everywhere. Um, and that to say, the reason why I'll be so shocked if they do it is because it's just a fundamental core of, wow, I, I don't think they'll do it personally. I, I don't think they'll ever do it. I don't think cross-faction rating will be a thing um, at, at, at any point. I just... And that's not that's not a dream I have for the game in the sense that that's not something where I'm like, if I had a list of things that I think they should change immediately, it's not on that list. I, I think the, the faction, uh, the, the difference between Alliance and Horde is something that's fundamental to World of Warcraft. It's fundamental to the Warcraft universe. And I, I think that there can certainly be times where the Horde and Alliance cooperate. We've seen it many times in the past, um, often through different paths to get to the same goal. Uh, but I feel like it's um, um, something that is is so core to that universe that removing that would be weird. It would just be it'd be a very strange experience for them to have a Tauren hanging out inside of Stormwind talking with a human who's best friends with an orc who's standing next to him with a goblin trying to sell them swords inside Stormwind. It'd just be weird. It'd be a very strange thing for the universe. So I don't think we'll see it personally. I don't think that's the thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I feel like they've sort of publicly breached the subject at this point in some press, which usually means that, you know, we're going to see some movement. I mean, the, the bottom line is that 
the faction imbalance for end game organized play is so pronounced in some situations like NA Horde, Oceania Alliance, stuff like that. I think they have to do something at some point for the long-term health of the game. Uh, and this, they haven't tried much, but what they have tried so far hasn't worked. Um, I, I think just saying, oh, there are no factions. I don't think that is ever really going to happen. Um, it would it, it would mess up too many systems in the game. It would mess up parts of the outdoor world, stuff like that. Um, I do think, you know, they they are probably going to implement some kind of cross faction PVE gameplay option um, because it's it's getting to the point where it's untenable at, at certain levels of play and even even at like at broad you know for the, among the broad player base it can be hard if you're if you're in an underrepresented faction in a region um what i would like to see would be to have it maybe tied specifically to um guild membership right so like you can you can play uh you know cross factional rating if you're in a guild with other people in the outdoor world you know that kind of um uh that that asymmetry would still exist i think the game would lose a lot if you just remove factions entirely and if like the outdoor world was not a place where the faction conflict was represented at all um even with like war mode off Right. There's there can still be interesting emergent gameplay in the outdoor world when you put a bunch of players in a space. And this group of players over here are tacitly cooperating even without like a party, right? Because they're the same faction. And they're competing with this group of players who are also tacitly cooperating. Like that can just create interesting uh tension. It can create interesting moments. And I, I think the game would be worse for it if they said okay factions just straight up don't exist um i think it would be a boon to the rating community if you could you know invite a cross-factional tune to your guild and then you could take you know horde groups could take alliance characters or alliance uh, you know characters could take horde characters into raid instances and they could communicate and trade items and you know do the you know, all the stuff you'd expect to do with a guildie do that in a in a raid in a dungeon instance but in the outdoor world it's you know your sort of uh, guild loyalty cross factionally doesn't apply like that's what i would kind of like to see for I, I mean i really feel like them taking this step to some degree is inevitable because i think they waited too long to act i don't think there's any way that they can counteract the inertia in in these imbalanced regions um I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they have some great ideas that can shake it up a bit. I, I feel like they didn't do anything about it for for years and years, and then the stuff they have tried really has been low impact. So, um, yeah, I I I just I, I can't see a scenario where they go on forever without opening that up at least for rating, if not rating in dungeons. Um, but I, I think there are ways they could do it without like, okay, we're removing the concept of Alliance and Horde. I, I think that kind of fundamentally breaks WoW in, in a bad way that doesn't necessarily even serve any players. It just, it removes texture from the world. It removes texture from the gameplay. It removes, you know, a, a degree of, of meaningfulness from player choices. Um, but the reality of the situation is you need people to play with um in this game to accomplish many things in it and if your choices mean that your options for other people to play with are limited to the point where like you can't do what you want to do then that is a huge problem so it'll be interesting i mean i i think it's a it's certainly a topic that's not going away this isn't something that's just going to fix itself magically between now and you know the second tier of the next expansion and um, I would expect that we'll hear at least more conversation from Blizzard about it in, you know, in the medium term. Yeah, I so I want to emphasize from a personal point of view for me. For what how I play the game, cross faction rating would be amazing because recruitment's a pain in the butt. Yeah, 
the you know being able to queue up for really high end contents hard um the competition between the two different factions when you're trying to complete content is just never on a fair pace because they have a deeper pool to pull from on one than the other they have um easier times filling rosters they have there's so many things easier about being the more populous faction i i say it that way because as jason mentioned in oceana alliance is the one that's just massively out there um so it's not just a, a everyone is horde problem it's it's also varies based off region um so for me and, and how I play the game, I'd be 100% behind, you know, having some sort of mercenary mode where you could do cross-faction raiding. Right? I think Jason's idea about making it so that the guild was what you were swearing your allegiance to, like you belonged to a faction, but you weren't um, sworn to actually kill this other faction. You're sworn to defend yours. You're not sworn to attack the other one. So by all means, you can be part of the alliance and team up with horde players to do a raid content thing because in that situation you have obviously a gentleman's agreement that we're all trying to accomplish the same goal together and everything's fair and you can go in and defeat this boss like that's that is very much where my mindset is about how i'd like the game to be but if someone straight up said hey tell me whether or not you think blizzard's going to do cross-faction raiding next expansion and that's going to be the big thing and that's sort of you know part of the closing this chapter of wow and moving on to a new chapter i'd be like no i i don't think that's what they're going to do um i think it's a problem that needs to get resolved i think it's something that there's a ton of work towards doing i don't think that blizzard is planning on having next expansion start off with cross cross-faction raiding um i think it's something that the, as i said they will they would ease their way into and we'd hear a lot about ahead of time I don't think we go from we're aware of this being an issue, but we have no plans currently to guess what next expansion. Here it is. I think it'll be, Hey guys. So for this particular piece of content, we're going to be looking at trying something like this sort of like that. They put a potion in the game that when you drank it, you were able to talk to people of the other faction um, and they could understand you. That was something that they chose to, to put in the game as a tester to see how that would go over, being able to communicate between one faction and another. Um, I would not be surprised if they went, hey, there's going to be a mercenary mode in the game for this raid where raid teams can get people from the other faction to raid with them. And it's something that's going to be, you know, normal, heroic, LFR-based. Or even just start off with LFR and go, guess what? LFR is now going to be cross-faction, and we're going to see how that goes. Like, that could even be a, a very big tester case right off the bat. So... Um, I, uh, I'm all for it in the sense of how I play the game will be much better and easier and I'll be able to play with my friends when I'll play with them and I want to level two characters on different factions and actually like try and maintain gear on both of them so I can play with one group of friends and play with another one. It makes my life easier, but, uh, I, I don't, I cannot see Blizzard starting off 10.0 with cross-faction rating. I just, uh, there, there would need to be a big lead up to that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's weird because it's just been, you know. It's a, it's a huge the, the problem. The problem didn't come out of nowhere, right? And it's yeah, like it's, it's a it's huge been, problem. Yeah, it's been such a problem for so long, and they really haven't done very much with it at all. So I don't know. I I expect that someday they'll do something. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair to like, say. I think they. Yeah. I mean, I think they have to at this point, yeah. right? And um, I don't know. I I think like you know, in fairness, one thing that I think Team Two tends to be guilty of is the big pendulum swing right the overcorrection mm. um perhaps they just say screw it we're you know we'll let the community solve this problem at this point um I, yeah i don't know it's it, it stinks because i wish it didn't have to work out this way yeah and and that like populations could have been relatively stable across the board and players could just kind of play whatever they want and have access to the content that they want to play. But it hasn't worked out that way. And I, I think we do need, you know, need like intervention from a development standpoint to do something about it at this point. Yeah, so that's fair. I, I, it's definitely not the last we're going to hear about it. I mean, I, you're, you, you might be right that we don't see anything immediately in, in, you know, next expansion, but Honestly, I think the longer they wait, the more of a disservice they're doing to the people that are in the less populous faction per region. Um, 
those people are still attempting to play the game, whether or not Blizzard does anything about the imbalance. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think we're going to hear a lot of, uh, I think like once Ian's in like PC gamer or whatever, wherever that interview was, and he like brings it up or he kind of acknowledges that like, it's not necessarily a hundred percent off the table. Then I think we can expect a lot more uh, conversation and, and potentially momentum behind, you know, solutions to this problem, whatever form they take. I, it's obviously at the forefront of, of stuff they want to address. Yeah, I guess an argument against them not doing it right at the beginning of 10.0, or at least talking about it then, is when we asked Morgan about Master Loot, he talked about that being a problem that they would not resolve midstream or not deal with midstream in an expansion. Yeah, It's something they do at the onset of an expansion. And so I, I would also agree that if they're going to deal with this faction issue, it's something they would do at the start of an expansion versus doing midstream through an expansion. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think it's so, in a patch uh, yeah. unless there's some kind of production emergency, right? Like if there if there's some reason why it's not, yeah. I mean, this is this is this seems like potentially game breaking, right? Like the game may literally not function if this yeah. is done wrong. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that, I would I would think it would be it would be tied to an expansion release for sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the argument the other way is we might see a 10.0 just because it's something they have to do at the start of an expansion and there's no way to dip your toe into this pool. They have to just dive right. in. So right. What do you do? Wait another that. two and a half years, three years. Exactly. Or, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know. It's Fair. a lot of this is just, you know, th this has been a long festering issue and uh, particularly in a couple regions and, you know, it's just the the, la the lack of action on it has now created a situation where it's like, you know, some urgency is going to be required potentially. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really my for myself, I don't particularly want to like have to go hoard middle of next expansion. Cause I can no longer realistically recruit people onto my NA Alliance raid team, right. you know, like uh, part of it too has to just do with the overall mood of the player base around the game. So if the next expansion just hits better then like, yeah, they'll still be in balance, but the player base is not healthy right now. And I think that exacerbates this problem. It does. It does. Yeah. All right, folks, so that's going to wrap up episode 490 of the starting zone. If you want to go to show notes this episode, which is the questions that we were asked on the show, you can leave us a comment uh, in the, sorry, you can, you can leave us a comment or you can make, um, Wow, I just totally screwed the whole thing up. I'm just going to start that over. That wraps up episode 490 of The Starting Zone. If you want to check out the show notes for this episode or leave us a comment on the show, head on over to thestartingzone.com, the official website for The Starting Zone podcast. If you want to contact the show and leave us a question or you can uh, ask us a comment or whatever it is, ask us a comment. Wow, man, I'm just, this is this is a late night for me, I guess, guys. This is just what it sounds like. Um, yeah, you can do that at thestartingzone at gmail.com or reach out to us on Twitter. And if you want to check out the regular show, we do it on Tuesdays, uh, and it sort of varies a little bit time-wise for Jason and I's schedule, but the live show goes up Tuesday. We'll obviously tweet out about it. You can follow us on Twitter at The Starting Zone, uh, or follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash The Starting Zone, and check out the episodes there when we're recording them live. They also go up to our YouTube channel uh, after the fact, which is youtube.com slash The Starting Zone. So feel free to check that out, throw a subscribe over there. If you're looking to uh, see that content as well. And Jason, where can folks find you on the internet? Oh, the best place to find me as always is over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald. Always talking whatever I'm getting into in and around WoW and other stuff. So come say hi. And also, I just want to I want to plug the uh, the Twitch channel because we did switch. We haven't talked about it on the show a lot, but we did switch to a new Twitch channel yes. a couple months ago. So um, make sure to check that out. Give it a follow. Um, we, you know, we we moved it over from the spazbot channel but not everybody came with so come check that out and also uh the youtube channel we we passed the threshold for um custom url so you can you can check us out over on youtube and you know you again that's another situation where it's like a new channel as we kind of move things over just to the tse branding so, so give those two a, a follow as well yeah that would certainly help us out a bunch if you're trying to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey or over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD. And with that, for Jason and myself, we want to say thanks for listening and jobs done.
Hi, everyone. I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons. They contribute a ton to our show and help us to improve on the content we create. Today, I'm giving a special shout out to Arajian, Bob, Celian, Jeff, Kapawi, Mibble the Mighty, and Shoral. Thank you. This sounder is for you.